The Vatican, one of the most powerful places on earth. It is a country within a city within another country. Part of the Roman Catholic Church, the Holy See. This is the seat of the Pope, a man who basically influences more than two billion people worldwide. The Vatican makes most of its money from the United States of America, so I have a very interesting tie to this place because I grew up going to Catholic school. Today we're going to walk from Rome all the way to Vatican, across this fence over here, to explore the secrets of the Vatican for a very brief broadcast before we go inside to the Vatican Museum. So join me as we learn a few secrets of this country within another country. Right here we have the colonnade by Gianluca Bernini. And each end of the colonnade looks like the entrance of a temple. So when we were in Greece, we learned about a few different orders of columns. Let me know what column is this? To be honest, it's a little bit of a trick question because this column is actually not part of the three, the DIC, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian. Hello, Kay, nice to see you here. Buonasera, Angela, hey y'all, hello. So this column is actually a Tuscan column. So it's neither Doric, Ionic, or Corinthian. Tuscan because it's not fluted like the other three columns. And it's also very simple, very straightforward. So look at that. Hasradati, nice to see you here. Hello, Wendy. Susu, I get to watch another live stream. Oh, yes, you do get to watch another live stream. So let's go to this stop over here, right over here. Something very important happened here. Now before this ever was a seat of one of the most powerful religions in the entire world, that being Catholic Christianity, this was a huge circus, but not in the context that you might think of in modern day America. There weren't clowns, at least we don't know of any. There weren't any big elephants. Well, maybe there were some, but it was a little bit more rare. It was. A circus meant to do horse racing and other type of kind of chariot events. It was the Circus of Nero. And also this contained the necropolis where people were buried just behind the modern day St. Peter's Basilica. But then St. Peter came over here. St. Peter's known as the Rock. Not Dwayne the Rock Johnson, but the Rock of the Christian world. He's the one who really established Christianity here in Europe. It is said that he died over here, and that's why they built the church upon the rock, upon where Peter died. To this day, the word Peter, Pietro, is the same root word as rock in Spanish and in the Romance languages, Petros. Hey, John, enjoying your travels and the commentary. I'm so glad. By the way, your entire Italian counterpart, Dam, is now on live Twitch uh, uh, too, says Henny. Yeah, we ran into an Italian, <laughs> an Italian live streamer, so that's cool.
right over here amongst the entrance of St. Peter's Basilica, which there is no line. This is crazy, ladies and gentlemen. Usually there's a gigantic line to get into St. Peter's Basilica. I'm kind of shocked how short it is. That means I'll be able to get inside maybe uh, later in the day or tomorrow to film a 360 video. Stay tuned. So right around here, in this general area, and I think there's a placard. Let's see if we can find it. There should be one. 1981. This was packed to the brim because the Pope used to have a public audience here. Right here is a placard. Used to have a public audience, and the Pope still does it. Today it's a little bit different, but before then, Pope John Paul II would go around in his automobile. Pope John Paul II would go around in this truck, zipping around the square, blessing and, and saying hello to people and kissing babies. But this day in 1981, there was a man in the crowd. He was a man who already murdered a journalist back in his native Turkey. He was pissed off at the Catholic Church. He thought the Catholic Church had too much power and was ruining from Turkey becoming liberated. So this man, by the name of Mehmet Ali Akja, came over here just a few meters, seven meters away from the Pope. The Pope was right over here in his open truck he took out a gun and shot the pope the pope nearly collapsed but people took photos and videos of him and they were shocked how calm he was even though he was shot right inside the pope survived but who was this guy Mehmet ali akja well he ended up being captured shortly thereafter and he also surrendered completely calmly he apparently was a part of a turkish group called the gray wolves but things end up getting complicated after he was arrested because he started saying that a lot of other people were involved he said that the bulgarians were involved because the last known location of him before he was in rome was in sofia bulgari which is the main city but then things get even more complicated because he says that those connections went even deeper, deeper to the Soviet Union. Ronald, you saw Pope John Paul II in uh, Manila. You can stand in the middle, I think, and there's a marker and see all the columns looking out like one layer says unfold Ooh, interesting unfold okay we'll try to find it vz says here here hey vz nice to see you here i love victoria tu camisa de un uh, leopardo si it's a leopard si victoria son leopardos hey vz i'm doing very well thanks for the two bedtime stories catch you later says andrew <laughs> andrew thank you so much for today So he said that there was a Bulgarian connection to his entire plot. But the thing is, there might have been a connection dating all the way back to Soviet Union. The CIA might have had known about this, and there were already rumors that the CIA was already finding evidence for it leaking to the Soviet Union, but they decided to do nothing, which people also found very weird. So people thought maybe the CIA was involved. Well, this was during the era of the Cold War. So, neither the CIA nor the KGB of Soviet Union wanted to encourage any side to do anything, because then it would mean mutual assured destruction with nuclear war. Who was really responsible? Well, you go back to 1979, Pope John Paul II was one of the first non-Italian popes in centuries. And he became a ardent speaker against communism 
during his reign as Pope. And in 1979, he decided to visit Poland, which was part of the Soviet Union. And in Poland, things got riled up. So riled up that one year later, 1980, Poland erupted into protests. People started saying that Pope John Paul II was their patron of the protests. This worried the Soviet Union because Pope John Paul II was becoming a sort of spokesperson for the fall of the Soviet Union. So was Mehmet Akja actually part of a larger Soviet plot or was he a madman? Well, something even stranger happened shortly after that. A few years later, Pope John Paul II fully recovered, goes to the prison where Mehmet Akja is inside and he goes and forgives him, he sits down with him and forgives him. Pope John Paul II also continued communication with his family for years. But things get even more complicated than that because in 1983, a little girl at 15 years old by the name of Emanuela Orlandi was the daughter of a banker here in Vatican who lived in the Vatican City. She went missing, going to music school just a few blocks away. When she went missing, a lot of people started calling the family. One of them was the so-called the American, because that person had an American accent, and demanded that Mehmet Akja would be liberated, or else the daughter will see consequences. Well, they tried to get an audience with the Vatican, asking for help. They started putting signs all around Rome. This ended up becoming a huge national sensation. Ended up becoming an international sensation. Then they started receiving more calls. And these calls started being sent by people who were Turkish accents. And they also said, Hey, release Mehmet Akjar or we will kill your daughter. Emanuela Orlandi was never found. The Vatican stayed completely silent. And after the Pope decided to forgive Mehmet Akja, there was no more investigation of the true plot of the assassination. If there ever was a true plot, maybe he was just a madman. The strange thing is Mehmet Akja was actually released from prison just a few years ago at the age of 53. Uh, and he's now free, or he's a little bit older than that, but he, now he's free. Hey, hi, it says I'll never forgive anyone who tried to kill me. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I, I, I get that someone is a very holy man, but uh, yeah, uh, that, that's a bit strange with uh, Pope John Paul II. Hey, Miss Fancy, nice to see you here. The devil, oh, oh, Jupiter, oh no. Let's not talk about two terrible things about the Vatican. The Septopology, says Milo. Milo, uh, the Pope forgave him, yes. I had tears seeing him, I felt so close to God, says uh, Oh, Ronaldo, no, that's, that's wonderful, Ronaldo. No. It's 72 degrees in New Jersey, it's now chilly, says Babo. It's super hot here in Rome. It's 91 degrees Fahrenheit. It's insanely hot in Rome. <laughs> and I'm wearing long pants because I, uh, I'm going to the Vatican Museum and they generally don't allow shorts, even though I see people walking in with shorts. I don't know all those details. Very interesting, says Hannah. Yeah, yeah, it is very interesting. Let's walk around a little bit more. There is no one here. Look how short the line is. This line would be an hour, two hours long or more. I remember buying a, October 2019, buying a skip the line ticket. I got in, you know, in 10 minutes, but I remember seeing the line that I could have decided to take if I wanted to save 10 euro. And it was insanely long. 
Well, you go into uh, uh, St. Peter's Basilica. There is barely any service in St. Peter's. I will be doing a 360 video bonus for supporters. I'll get access to uh, St. Peter's Basilica video. Hey, Monica, nice to see you here. Very interesting indeed, says Wendy. Oh, I'm so glad you think so, Wendy. Do they have a VIP tour? They do have uh, something that would be a VIP tour. Yeah, they have like a early tour where you get some breakfast and you get to see the Vatican Museum and the Sistine Chapel before it officially opens to the public, meaning it'll be very empty. You'll probably be in the Sistine Chapel with only about 15 people. And then they also have a after hours tour, which is near closing. And near closing, it's also very, very empty. So you can do that instead. Let's get closer. I know, I've stood in that line says, okay, yeah, it gets a, a crazy crowded. This is, this is weirdly empty. You know why it's weirdly empty? Well, we went to Trastevere yesterday. Yesterday we went to Trastevere. What are the countries that are mostly open right now for tourism? Think about it. Who are mostly the tourists here? Most of the tourists here are either from Western Europe, so France or UK, or Northern Europe, like uh, Germany, Central Europe, Germany, or they're coming from America. Most of those countries are Protestant. Um, so they're not really coming here to the Vatican. The Vatican, now I realize all of South America is closed. So almost no South American country is traveling here. Um, a lot of African countries are also closed. Brazil is closed, which is the lar one of the larger Catholic countries in the world. Uh, and then uh, a lot of other countries like Filipinos can't travel here. There's so many countries that are Catholic countries can't travel over here. So that's why it's so, so empty. I think that might be the main reason because a lot of those Americans that are hanging out in Trastevere, A, there's not that many, and B, they're probably not, all, not all of them are coming here. So, yeah. Can a Protestant take a tour? Yeah, yeah, any, any religious denomination is allowed inside. Uh, you just can't wear very short skirts or very short shorts. Male or female, you can't wear those two. And you do have to cover up your arms, so you can't wear, like, uh, no sleeves. I'm not sure if they require that of women, but no, men don't wear a tank top. The Vatican is a must visit for Catholics, says Ronald. It's a must visit for, I would say, almost anyone. It is literally one of the most beautiful places on earth, in my opinion. Not just because of its religious importance, even though it do definitely does have that, but because of its immense, beautiful architecture. So what we're seeing right now is the architecture made first by Bermonti. And then um, one of the most famous artists of all time, Miko Angelo was hired to finish up this basilica back in the 1600s or late 1500s. He ended up making the dome. And then in the 1600s, our main guy, the superstar bad boy sculptor, ended up making this beautiful colonnade. And this colonnade, he said that it was almost like a motherly embrace of the church. Bernini was alive during the time of the Protestant Reformation, so everything was going haywire in Europe. And Protestant Reformation wasn't merely a dispute of theology in the church. The Protestant Reformation in many areas of Europe was a very, 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 very bloody affair. Sometimes so bloody that you cannot make a movie out of it because it'll be bloodier than most horror films. Uh, check out what happened with the Anabaptists in Germany. <laughs> so things got really crazy during the Protestant Reformation. 
and Bernini was alive during that era. So the church took a new stance. They've always been a patron of the arts, but then in the 1600s, they really realized that art was one of the best ways to convince people uh, or to show people the, the light of the church or to show people the beauty of the church. They really felt that. And it, almost it was an opposite stance of a lot of Protestant reli religions where they decided to go against that beauty. Uh, they thought the beauty was more within. Maybe with the Quakers, they thought it was more within. Um, with the Lutherans, they thought, you know, all this is ostentatious too much. So the Catholic Church really leaned into that kind of extravagance. And that's why Bernini ended up making a massive entrance for St. Peter's Basilica. Because without this, St. Peter's Basilica would be just another basilica. It's still the second largest religious structure in the world. But it just might not look like much. And then even back then, before the 1930s, a lot of that avenue that you see very open was actually this. That's how St. Peter's Basilica looked like. Right here. Look at that. There's a bunch of old tenement buildings in the neighborhood called El Borgo. Hey, B. Griffin says, see Dan Carlin's podcast on the Siege of Munster. Yeah, that's not what I'm referring to. He made an episode about the Anabaptists in, in uh, Germany. More photos of what the neighborhood used to look like in Burgo until the 1930s. So there's one more last strange thing I want to talk all of you about. We are now venturing into the realm of conspiracy. Conspiracy theories. Not history. So do your own research before you talk about any of these topics. But I think they're both fun and interesting to learn about. Back in 2002, a man published... Well, actually, let me show you actually before. I actually had a photo of Pope John the Paul II um, forgiving Mehmet Akja right here. Father Brun was a clergyman of the Catholic Church. And in 2000, 2002, he wrote a book about the mysteries of the Vatican. Within this book, he said that he was a part of a secret project called the Chronovisor. He worked with a man called Pellegrino Ernetti. Pellegrino Ernetti, in his deathbed, said that this was completely true. There was a device called the chronovisor in the hands of the Vatican, invented by him and 12 other scientists and in collaboration with Brun. But what is the chronovisor? Well, he did, uh, did not want to divulge the names of the people he collaborated with, but he said two names. One was Enrico Fermi. He was an Italian-American scientist involved in the Manhattan Project. One of the men who invented the atomic bomb that killed hundreds of thousands. The other one was the man who invented the rockets that probably would help a lot of those atomic bombs later on during the Cold War, helped us get into the moon, Werner Ron Braun. But Werner Ron Braun was actually a Nazi scientist. There was a operation, this, okay, so this part is actually history. There was a CIA operation or American operation called Operation Paperclip. This is, this part is real. Operation Paperclip was in charge of getting a lot of these top thinkers of the Nazi regime to come into America. They would sneak them in, give them citizenship, and make sure they end up getting jobs in these top agencies like NASA. He is one of them. 
But this guy ended up really revolu revolutionizing rocketry. He is known as the father of rocketry in the US. Now that part is 100% true, 100% true. Werner von Braun was a ex-Nazi scientist who ended up working for the Americans and basically revolutionized rocketry. But what was a chronovisor? Did Fermi and Braun actually work with this guy, uh, Pellegrino Ernetti? Well, Pellegrino Ernetti was a Benedictine monk. And many decades before then, he was working on studying Gregorian chants that were recorded uh, many, many decades prior. He was working with another man called Agustino, who was also a clergyman. And as he was studying the harmonics of the Gregorian chants, he knew that there was something interesting about Gregorian chants. You know, a lot of people believe that music has the power to heal. So he was trying to study that power. He wanted to know what made certain music styles like Gregorian chants extra special, extra powerful. As he was studying these Gregorian chants, he saw a recording and he heard a voice, a voice that was not part of the choir. This is according to Arnetti, so no one knows if this is true or false, made up, embellished, no one knows. I'm just telling you the story that Arnetti said. The voice he heard was the father of Agustino, the priest he was working with. And this gave him an idea because at that moment he knew at least according to him, that sounds are permanently imprinted upon our universe. Every single sound, every single image has a permanent imprint upon our universe. Just like energy is neither created nor destroyed, sound and video aren't either, or images aren't either. Now, there's actually a field of studies uh, that's actually scientific called paleoacoustics. And paleoacoustics says that sounds are imprinted in the very pottery that we make because pottery has ridges. And as you're making this pottery, you actually capture the sounds as the pottery was being made. This is actually a real scientific, scientific field. So check it out, paleoacoustics. So what did Ennetti Pellegrino end up doing? Well, he ended up uh, making a project where he wanted to see if he can synthesize and capture the sounds and the images from long times past. So with the help of these two famous scientists plus 10 others, he ended up making the chronovisor. And the chronovisor is this machine. It's almost like a television. It was a cathode ray tube, but this cathode ray tube had some crazy quantum science behind it and they were able to look into the past. What did Ennetti Pellegrino see? Or Pellegrino Ennetti see? Well, let me show you. This is the article that popped up in 1972 in a magazine called the Domenico. La Dominica de Codier. And it had this image on it. I'm gonna pull it up right now. Apparently, this image was taken with the chronovisor. Apparently. Of course, this is all conspiracy theory. This is not history. But this is a real publication that they put this image. Who knows how this image was made, truly. But allegedly, it was a still shot from the crucifixion of Jesus which Annetti saw with his own very eyes. That's very interesting. So 
So does this chronovisor actually exist? Well, Annetti said that he not only saw the crucifixion of Jesus, he also saw one of the most famous speeches by Cicero in ancient Rome. He also saw the day that the Republic of Rome was actually solidified, um, which was quite a while back in BC era. He also allegedly saw uh, Napoleon in one of the major battles, I think it would have been Waterloo. Yeah, he went back through history. Now, he himself did not go back. It was almost like watching a Netflix show. You would just kind of tune in to a, a past event and see the images and the sounds. And apparently he saw this. So this article came out. There was murmurings, more conspiracies started popping up. And something odd happened in 1988. 1988, the Vatican Church decided to do a decree. They said that anyone using a device that breaks the laws of time and space would be excommunicated from the church. Which is rather weird. They did not deny the chronovisor, but they, I don't know, maybe they were just, you know, maybe they're just uh, planning ahead for the eventual quantum revolution and we end up finding out that we can transcend time and space. Maybe that's the case. Or maybe the chronovisor actually existed. Is it still inside these walls? Well, according to Arnetti, it was dismantled. He, on his deathbed, said that it was all true. A lot of people convinced him to say otherwise, but he decided to say it was all true and that it was dismantled because if anyone got their hands on it, it would make a dictatorship so strong that would be the worst thing we've ever seen on this earth. So what do you think? Does the Vatican still have access to a time travel device? Who knows? So <laughs> that was the story of Edniti Pellegrino. <laughs> Axie says you're a great historian. Thank you so much. And again, that that uh, most of that story was, is not history. Um, the accounts of Ernetti are first-hand accounts from him, indeed, which you can read because they were captured by uh, Brun, Father Brun, and also written about in the book. But anything that he mentioned within that story, we don't know. The thing is that. There's a lot of conspiracies relating to the secret Vatican archive. And you might think, okay, that's just a purely made up thing. Of course, the Vatican doesn't have a secret archive. Archive, you can probably get access to it if you're some type of researcher. Well, <laughs> the Vatican actually called it the secret Vatican archive. It is not a made up name. People are not saying it's merely a secret archive. Uh, but no, the Vatican themselves called it the secret archive. So, <laughs> yes, there is a secret archive. What's in there? We don't know. How do you get access? Almost no one does. Um, so, who knows? <laughs> right. We got some uh, clergymen right over here. Hey, Fuzzy Ducks, I want to get my hands on it. <laughs> I don't know what to think of the Vatican presently, says Lisa. <laughs> Elias says, great narration. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Elias. Great story, says Bella. Kind of spooky story, says Mark. Well, at least they don't trust Adolf about the chronovisor, says Clemens. Mm. Clemens, yeah, I think the chronovisor probably is after uh, World War II. It was if it, if it, if it's a real thing. Uh, Ernetti Pellegrino said that it was probably made between 1950 and 1970, maybe a little bit earlier. So between 1950 and 1965, around there. Houdini had a, a, a way of opening. Uh, Houdini had a way of opening locks, but it was destroyed. Says Dwayne. Ariel, if you had the chronovisor, what would you watch? Miss Fancy has a great question. Let us know that. Uh, answer that question yourselves. Let us know. What would you watch if you had access to the chronovisor? I think if I had access to the chronovisor, 
I would say the same answer I had for for uh, time travel. If I can travel to any point in time, or if I can view any point in time, I would view before the Great Flood. Was there a Great Flood? We we don't know. You know, again, that's that's prehistory. Uh, there's a lot of geological evidence that there was some sort of Great Flood. Uh, so I would go back 13,000 years ago and see what was happening on Earth back then. If there was anything. We could have just been in caves back then, making tiny little axes. That could have been the case. But I'm very curious if that was the case indeed. Or if not. So that's where I would go back in time. Uh, Rafael says Noah. Yeah, I mean, Noah's one but hundreds of great m flood myths across the entire world. It's a bit strange that there's that many flood myths. It's a bit strange. Is it pure coincidence? Maybe. Is it some type of archetypal fear of water? Maybe. Could be. There's a good, there's a good uh, reason for that. Or does it indicate to uh, some type of collective trauma that we all experience as humans? I would say there's also a great possibility for that as well. So that's when I would go back to uh, the chronovisor if I can watch it like a television. Hey, uh, Lisa says Noah's Ark was discovered, by the way. <laughs> yeah, people have said that over and over again. Uh, the people have gone to Mount Ararat, Arat, I think it's called, in um, what was it, Armenia. And they tried to discover, see if they can find it. Every myth is based on some type of reality, says Susan. I think so. I'm part of, I'm part of that uh, belief. Hyde says there was a great flood uh, that swept down Norway 12,000 years ago and flooded Doggerland. Yes, Hyde. So some places were indeed flooded, like Doggerland, which was between England and Europe. So uh, England was actually connected to mainland Europe, and that was indeed flooded. So there are there is major floods that have happened throughout history. Did that flood affect all of humanity? That's that's uh, that's another story. And Alexis from Puerto Rico, welcome. All right, everyone. I have to bid you adieu because I have my tickets for the inside of the of the museum, which now I got rushed to. So I hope you enjoyed this broadcast. Um, Miss Fancy says I will go back to ancient Egypt. I'm so glad um, some of you tuned in. I'll be going back inside live inside the Vatican Museum in about 40 minutes or so, just a little bit after 6 p.m. So let's go inside the Vatican Museum. One more time, the Vatican here. I hope you enjoyed these stories. Stories that usually no one's going to tell you because, you know, people think they're crazy, but I think they're fun to learn about. Not everything has to be precise history. One thousand five hundred stars sent. Thank you so much, K, for letting me know. Sorry, I can't read the stars. There was a lot of sun. I couldn't read. I can't read the comments too well. Also, I was telling the story. But thank you so much for leaving those stars. I truly appreciate every each and one of you who left stars and PayPal's and super chats. Everyone, I'll see you in about forty minutes or so inside the Vatican Museum. Keep being awesome and always keep on exploring. Have a great day, everyone. Buonasera! Thank you, Maru.